All right. Good morning, everyone. All right. Uh, welcome to those who are joining us online. I hope you can hear me okay. All right. Uh, let's just begin with a word of prayer. So maybe one of us can lead in prayer. Any one of us? Go ahead. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, um, for this time that we have um, to get to know more of you, to get to know of, um, how you um, have done things on this earth. And, um, and Lord, I pray that um, our hearts and minds be open and that, that you help us, Lord, to understand what we are being taught and uh, that you help um, Pastor Paul to... Um, Teach well, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for this time. In name I pray. Amen. Amen. Right. Thank you. All right. So last week we were talking about uh, Isaiah 53, the cross described. We looked at many points there. We looked at uh, uh, the authenticity of the book of Isaiah and, of course, the entire Bible as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about the Dead Sea Scrolls and how these scrolls were found. And they were found word to word perfect. Uh, uh, to what we are reading right now. Uh, then we looked at a few aspects of how the cross was described from the Old Testament, right? Uh, Isaiah 52 and 53 had a lot of it revealed. Uh, Behold my servant, then his massage was marred. Uh, uh, he shall sprinkle his blood with many nations, right? So uh, the shedding of blood happened there. The arm of the Lord revealed. Uh, as a tender plant, a root out of dry ground, meaning his tenderness, his loving kindness uh, was, was displayed in his earthly life. Uh, a man of sorrows and grief, um, uh, he knew all the while that the cross is some place that he has to go. Uh, if Isaiah 53 talks about a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as and we hid, so it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. So was Jesus despised? Yes? Was Or was he you know, glorified as a person? Right. On the cross, he was despised. They did not esteem him, right? Uh, then we see he was a man of sorrows and grief. He bore our griefs and our sorrows. Now... Let's picture this, the revelation of the Holy Spirit to a person hundreds of years before. Maybe he did not know what the cross is, right? Now, when we look at it and we say, hey, Isaiah spoke about the cross. But Isaiah didn't know. He probably didn't, you know, the, the whole thing of the crucifixion was not yet, you know, come into place. Right? He didn't know. But he talks about it. He will bear our griefs. He will bear our sorrows. right? And it, it is a wonderful prophecy there. And he did it for our peace. Uh, so now, in the Old Testament, there was no peace between man and God. right? Oh, when, when the people of Israel or in the Old Testament, there was no feeling of, OK, I am with God and God is with me. Why? Because the cross was not yet there. The sprinkling of the blood for the atonement of sin was only done once. Right? But there was still this feeling of guilt and condemnation. Right? Uh, for through the cross, we find peace. And the iniquity of us all uh, was upon him. That means all our sins, all our griefs, all our shame, our, uh, you know, uh, the, the place where we had to go was upon him. Right, uh, and that's where we stopped. Uh, we, now we'll pick up from as sheep uh, before its shearers. Let's read Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Look at the word oppressed there driven as an animal, harassed, distressed, or painfully abused. Right? We, we, we talk about this, no, the spirit of oppression. While we are praying, what do we say? Every spirit of oppression, I bind you in Jesus' name. We pray that? Yes? What is this oppression? Uh, oppression is basically being pressed down. Right? If you, uh, I'm sure all of you must have seen uh, you know, the cattle working in the fields. Right? 
it's a yoke upon them have you seen that yoke right they put that yoke on the on the ox or the uh, or the or the, the the cow what happens it's an oppression right it's oppressed to do the work right so here he's bringing out that kind of an allegory and he's saying he was oppressed meaning he was driven out as an animal harassed distressed painfully abused and he was afflicted which means he was he was looked down he was forced he was treated badly hmm? yet he opened not his mouth he was led as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before his shearers is silent so he opened his mouth not right look at that he he was oppressed for us he was harassed he was beaten he he took on that oppression for you and me right and he was afflicted he was treated badly now all this talking about the lord jesus years back right and it says that as a sheep before its shearers now why is this sheep come into a uh, picture right we see the lord jesus as a picture of a lamb and a lion right that's very interesting uh, a sheep right uh, when uh, especially in the old testament when you see look when you look at a sheep uh, the sheep was used for most of the sacrifice right the sheep or the goat and every time a sheep was taken they wouldn't defy they wouldn't say you know you know they wouldn't uh, try to run away from the sacrifice they were very like you know they were they they had this instinct of just being how they are right this obedience it was it's it was a picture of obedience right so you don't see a sheep trying to run away have you seen you seen try have you seen uh, if you go to the chicken store what happens the chicken by the time you take the chicken is already trying to fly away that's not what's going to happen with a sheep right because by nature a sheep yes they go astray but they know that if it's time it's time right and i was reading something very uh very very you know it really struck me it was very interesting this is this article about the sheep and then i read it many years back i forget where i read it but it said that when a when a snake right now i don't know if this is medically proven right uh, but the writer is writing and uh, of course he's got this medical background but uh, but this is what he says when a snake bites a sheep the sheep has a certain kind of blood right where the sheep will not die but the snake will die right i read that i was like wow Oh, but I don't know whether it is uh, medically proven. But if it is, there's a powerful, powerful act of God. This is nature. And, and when you look at nature, there's so much that point towards creation and how God has created things. But maybe we can read about it and find out. It just came to my mind. A sheep uh, is, is, is somebody or someone who can very easily be led down to a sacrifice you don't have to hold the sheep and now now the sheep now i don't know how they are now uh, but you don't have to forcefully push a sheep to the sacrifice they go and it's talking here about as a sheep jesus a, a gentle lamb he went to the cross nowhere in the new testament we see uh, during the Lord Jesus' persecution and when he was going to go to the cross, is there any place he says, no, I don't want to go to the cross. Uh, it's okay, let me do something else. You don't see it, right? He knew it all the while, right? Look at this, Matthew 27, 12 and 14, 12 through 14. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? Be, but he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Now, I don't know why the governor marveled greatly. You see, if, in some places, Jesus answered. 
In some places, Jesus spoke a lot. If you read Matthew 24, he's speaking and speaking and speaking. Right? But in some places, Jesus did not speak. It was to fulfill prophecies. Right? 1 Peter 2, 17 through 23. Uh, maybe one of us can read. 1 Peter chapter 2, 17 to 23. It's on your notes. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commandable, it because of consents toward God on endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credits is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commandable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered from for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was revealed, did not reveal in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Yeah, thank you. So here, Peter is writing to the believers in the church, and he's reminding them about the cross. Right? He's reminding them that, the, that walking in the imitation of Jesus is important in our everyday life. So what does he say? Verse 21, uh, initially, he's, verse 17 onwards, he's talking to the brothers in the church. right? And verse 21, he says, For this, for this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in him. Right? He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in him or in his mouth, who was then reviled, but he did not revile in return. He suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Right? So this is a wonderful example for us. Our people, there will be times, right? Oh, now remember that. The church where Peter is writing to is a persecuted church. The same letter he says, "You are living stones. Oh, you are you are God's people. You are God's. Uh, you are coming into God's kingdom, right?" And he's encouraging the believers. Why? Because they were a persecuted church. Now, the general tendency is if somebody persecute us, we you know we want to. For for example, somebody says something to you. What do we do? General tendency is to retaliate. Right? They say, hey, you know, you didn't do this properly. Oh, what about you? What did you do well? General tendency. So Paul is Peter is writing to the believers and saying, see, people are going to persecute you. People are going to say all this Christianity, we're going to persecute you, we're going to kill you. So he's writing to the believers and he's telling them, hey, look at the Lord Jesus, what he did. There was no sin in him, there was no deceit in his mouth, yet he willingly took up the cross. He willingly suffered. He did not threaten. He did not commit himself to any sin. He did not commit himself to the people, but he committed himself to God. So basically, Peter is saying, follow this example. I follow what, what Jesus did, and that's more than enough. Right, next one. From prison and from judgment. 53 and verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Right? Now, remember Jesus, uh, Matthew 27, Jesus was put into prison. Right? He stayed there. He was held there in the palace overnight, and then he was brought to judgment before. Pilate. Again, even the intricate, the small details written by Isaiah. And that's why this Isaiah 52 and 53, it, it basically talks about the whole life of Christ. Right? 
And I always wonder, imagine Jesus going back and reading it and he's saying, hey, this is me. Right? This is me. This is what's going to happen to me. Right? The Bible says that uh, in the book of Matthew, it says the Lord Jesus grew in wisdom. Right? So as a young boy, probably he went, started reading, said, hey, this is me. So one day I have to do this. One day I'll be carrying the burden of the cross. I'll be carrying all the sins, the griefs of people. People are going to ridicule me. People are going to mock me. And imagine reading the portion where uh, you know, they, they pulled off his beard and they spit on him. Jesus is probably reading that. He knew it was him. Right? He knew that he has to go through it. Uh, and he was willing to do it. Right. Next one. <laughs> with the wicked and with the rich. 53.9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now, he made his grave with the wicked. Where did Jesus die? Between two thieves. Right? Uh, now, if you look, at, uh, you look at the difference between the two thieves and Jesus, the two thieves probably were not beaten and scourged as much as Jesus was, right? Why is that? I always, you know, as a, as a young boy, I used to always think, why did they beat Jesus so much? They could have just crucified him. No. no. First of all, they said, okay, Pilate's plan was we'll beat him and we'll leave him off. Okay, so they scourged him properly. Could have left him. Or they could have directly said, okay, get crucified. And God knows, right? okay, crucifixion, done. But the point was, the blood had to be shed. The blood had to go. The, the entire suffering of sin, the entire you know, grief and pain and sorrows had to be taken up by him. So it was not a quick death. It was not something that, you know, okay, just die. That's easy. But God made it in such a way because it is the judgment of God upon his son and all the judgment was put on this person, the Lord Jesus Christ as a human being right? and historians say that oh, you know, the, the, the whole fact of Jesus carrying the cross and going up to that mountain is physically so difficult after that scourging Physically, like, remember that he was a normal person, right? He had um, strength. He had weaknesses in his body. Right? He, needed, he was tired. He was sleepy. He did everything. Right? It's not like Jesus said, okay, you know, uh, now I'm, my stomach is full. I can be all right. No. Probably his leg pain from all the walking. And right? the ship, he was happily sleeping. Maybe he was very tired. Right? And but we see that, you know, the historians and theologians say that for him to carry the cross and go up that mountain is, is, a, is a big challenge. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. It was because of you and me. That whole, the entire judgment of God had to be on him. What if Jesus said, oh, no, I cannot. Please take me to the nearest doctor. I'll come back after two days to be crucified. No. Once, you remember what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane to Judas? What did he say? Do what you have to do. The time has come now. Do what you have to do. So it was like a, you know, he was resetting his mind and saying, the time is now. No more, I'm going to be, you know, a person who's going to do all these wonderful miracles and all. I'm going to be a sheep, a lamb. They will spit at me, they will ridicule me, they will mock me, but I'll keep quiet. Why? Because I have to take the judgment of God on the cross. How long would it have taken for Jesus, you know, when they were ridiculing him on the cross, by saying, if you are the Messiah, come down, no, from the cross. How long would it have taken? A few seconds. You know, probably Jesus would have said, Father, Send two angels. Or oh, he didn't even need angels. He would have just said, 
You would have just got down from the cross. As simple as that. Could he have done it? He could have done it. But he didn't. As a sheep to the slaughter. So was he. Right? And then we see that with the rich at his death, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, pleaded for the body of Jesus. And Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And finally, uh, Pilate could, not, could find no fault against him. Right? And there's this book where we talk about, you know, this writer writes and he says, imagine Pilate. You know, here there's Jesus standing in front of Pilate. Imagine Pilate standing in front of Jesus during the last uh, judgment. What's he going to say? Right? Or forget about Pilate. Imagine these, you know, these people who have, um, you know, persecuted Christians. Uh, what about uh, the Jews who killed about five million Jews? Hitler. What are they going to do? They're all going to stand. And this time, it's not going to be a lamp. Right? It's not like Jesus is saying, oh, yeah, whatever you say is fine. Oh, so he's the lion and the lamb. Us, he'll be the lamb. Right? But to others, he'll be the lion. Right? And you'll learn more in eschatology, end times. OK. He shall see his seed and prolong his days, Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Look at that. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now, you know, if you have good friends, Right, uh, and once you you know you get married, you have children. When your child, you know, just gets hurt or falls, and you know, it gets hurt, none, no parent is pleased. Right, you must have told that child a hundred times, "Don't do this. You may get hurt." But after telling a hundred times, when the child falls, you're not going to say, "Ah, I told you, no, you'll fall." You will not do that. Why? Because it's your child. No matter what it is, you will say you will go and try to look after the child, make sure that he's all right. But here it's see you see that the father was pleased to bruise the, the son. He was pleased, he was happy. Right? Can you believe that? He was he was pleased to do it. Why? Because he knew that this was the sacrifice that was needed for the forgiveness of sins. Otherwise, it's going to be the same old story. Old Testament. What is the story? Cows and bulls. Blood sacrifice. Same old offerings. It's going to be the same old thing. But this was needed. So God was pleased. Basically, what happened on the cross this is a picture, right, that I'm giving you. Father, Son, three of them together. They are one. Jesus said, the Father's in me, I'm the Father. Yes? And many places we see the Trinity coming together in the baptism. Uh, the Father spoke, the Son, and the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove. Right? So Jesus walked in the same Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that you and I are walking in. Right? Now, what happened on uh, uh, in this whole in this whole uh, time was now the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three are one. But on the cross, there was a separation. So he remember Jesus said, uh, "I and the Father are one. The Father is in me. And I am in the Father." But at the cross, there was a separation. And the Father is putting all the sin and grief and shame and all the judgment of God upon His Son. There was a separation. So when Jesus cried out, Why have you forsaken me? It was at that moment when He realized His separation 
from the Father. And it is only on the cross where Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anywhere else does he say God? Or oh, everywhere else he says, Father. Right? It pleases the Father. I've come to the Father's in heaven. Anywhere he says God, he doesn't. Because at the cross, there's a separation. He became like you and me, like sin, so that you and I can call him Father. Now, in the Old Testament, you can't call God Father. Can we? We can't. That's why when Jesus, you know, when Jesus was there and he told the disciples, told him, teach us how to pray, what does he say? Oh, Father, what in heaven? In, what in heaven? Now, this is still the cross has not yet happened. Imagine the disciples, our Father. We're talking about God, the Father. We're talking about Yahweh, Jehovah God, the God who was with Abraham, Isaac, and Moses, that God. Yes, He's going to become your Father. So it would have been a big revelation for them. So I can call God Father. I can have a relationship with Him. They never understood it. But Jesus knew that when he is going to call God, Father God, there was this separation. He became like you and me, that now you and I can call him Father. Remember uh, the last sentence, what does Jesus say? Father, into your hands, come on, my spirit. Right? It was as if that relationship was restored. Right? He said, God, why have you forsaken me? Forget about these nails and forget about these crown and, and you know the, the beating and forget about everything that is happening to me physically. This is painful, but you leaving me and that separation from you is that forsakenness. It is too much. I cannot bear that. Because I am in you and you are in me. Now it's like you're saying you're no longer with you're not with me right now. You're not in me. It's like it's like you know the Lord Jesus is saying, God, and God is just turning his face away to his own son. So that when we come, he will not turn his face away. You see that substitution? We'll talk about substitution in the next um, chapter. A literal fulfillment here, we see that he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. He arose to see his descendants. Uh, so it was not the end. When you say prolong his days, was the resurrection, right? Uh, a figurative fulfillment uh, where the plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it. Life, life, and more life, and God's plan was will deeply prosper through him, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Right later on, it says uh, in the book of Hebrews, he writes that when he died and when he rose again from the dead, right, he went, he took the keys, the authority of Satan. Of death and hell. He's basically telling Satan, You see what I did on the cross? I lived a perfect life. And now you're on the cross. I've defeated you. You're destroyed. So he takes the keys, the authority from the devil. Right? And when he takes that, the, the father says, Now at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Right? All honor, dominion, authority belongs to him. Was it there before? Yes. He's come back. His place is being restored. But there's a difference now. The difference is in 2 Timothy it says, there is a one mediator between God and man. Who is that? The man, Jesus Christ. Right? There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. So now, 
when we go to the Lord Jesus, you know, last Sunday we were talking about the gift of righteousness, right? So when we go to the Lord Jesus now and we say, God, I don't want to sit for class today. I'm very tired. Now, Jesus understands what is tiredness. Yes or no? God, my Lord Jesus, my legs are fading, my body is fading, I'm so tired. He understands. Now you tell the father, my leg is paining, body is paining. Of course, there's this nature where he understands. But as a mediator, Jesus completely understands. He knows what it is. God the Father may not know what is pain. Of course, he, he, he understands with us all that is there. But as a mediator, he's, saying, he's telling the Father, hey, Father, I know what it feels like. Right? And then you know, there's temptations. The devil is coming. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's tempting us. And every time this temptation comes, sometimes we fall, sometimes we overcome. And then when we fail, we say, hey, I, I don't want to go back. I don't want to, you know, how many times will I ask forgiveness? But remember, Jesus is the one mediator, the man, Jesus Christ. Right? So we can always go back to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know you were tempted. You overcame. Help me to overcome. And we have a high priest who sympathizes with us. Amen. Right, so we don't have to, we don't have to feel hey, guilty, right? And say, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. Right? But we can just go to him and say, This is what it is. Right? In the old testament, we could not do that. Right? Next one. He shall justify many. Uh, Isaiah 53 and verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he will bear my iniquities. Right? Uh, sin had to be punished. And his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus put, sorry, the Father put every demand of sin, every judgment, everything on Jesus. And he was satisfied that he did it. Right? How many of you had a good meal and you're satisfied? It's never happened here? <laughs> but if, uh, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you have a good meal, you're just satisfied. What happens? You give that person the, you know, the costliest food or the tastiest food again. You say no. It looks good. I wouldn't mind tomorrow or later in the day, but now satisfied. I, or how many of you? Uh, this happens to me. We drink all this, you know, these soft drinks and fruit juice and all of that. But for me personally, I need water. I can drink all these, you know, the, the coffee and juice and you know all these things that are there. But only water quenches thirst. Yeah. Because the other things can satisfy you for some time. And actually, if you see, you, you have these soft drinks, after some time, you're even more thirsty. It's just at that moment, it just... Here, what does the Father say? I have satisfied everything. No more will I have to put judgment upon my people because of what Jesus did. Now, there's a difference. We, we were talking about uh, the covenants, right? If we want, we can walk away from the covenant and say, I don't want. Then what is happening? We are opening ourselves to the enemy. So the enemy is going to come and cause trouble. But if we are in covenant, God has already put every judgment upon the cross. So if things are not going well in our life, it's not the judgment of God. Sometimes God, you know, we must understand that God has his ways of dealing with things. And he has plans, he has ways, uh, how to open doors for us. Of course, all of us, you now we want to be in ministry, we want to do something. Uh, if God says, okay, initially you go uh, arrange the chairs in church, it's not judgment of God. It's just that God is, you know, opening up a door. You know, yesterday um, we were talking to, uh, after the, you know, the prayer here, uh, just talking to some of them here and they said, uh, hey, how did you learn playing the kahoon? I said, I don't know. What happened was when we were in Mangalore, 
right? We had a lot of worship leaders, like two, three worship leaders. So what I did was I started playing drums a little bit, very little. I don't know much. Right? So just little, just to keep the beat, right? I, I don't know the technical terms and all that. But I did that for three and a half years. So when I came here, I don't know that, you know, it's going to help me later on. For me, OK, there's a worship leader, so it made sense to play another instrument. Right? So in that way, God has his ways of training us in different ways. So never look at God's way as a judgment. Oh, God, maybe I've not prayed enough, so that's why no opportunity is coming to me. Or maybe I've not read the Bible enough, that's why no opportunity. God does not look that way. He will open the right door at the right time. We just need to be faithful. right? By, the, by his wisdom, the Lord put to naught the wisdom of the world. And we talked about this as well. Um, the wisdom of the cross being far greater than the wisdom of the world. Why is it wisdom? All across from the Old Testament, if you see, God is a God of wisdom. Right? So from Genesis chapter 2, uh, he knew the plan. He knew everything that he was going to do. So it was it was the wisdom of God. God, why did you choose crucifixion? It's the wisdom of God. Why not, you know, like Apostle Paul, he would, uh, you know, just chop his head off. No, it was the wisdom of God. There had to be full suffering, right? Now, when you talk about the cross, it's not wisdom. It's foolishness, right? But for God, it's wisdom. But when God did this to the cross, when he uh, came up with this whole, uh, you know, the cross and sins of the world being on this person, it is, it may look and sound foolish for some of us, but it's the wisdom of God. Even now, you know, yesterday we were, you know, uh, during the prayer, we heard about how these wonderful revival movements, and even now, Yes, it's true. Punjab is seeing a huge harvest. How is it? Is it because uh, you know, these are, you know, probably, uh, you know, I was reading this article, uh, that India Today article, which Pastor is talking about. Carpenters will go, plumbers, plumbers and carpenters, they work the whole day, right? Or whatever in, the, uh, uh, in their shops or in apartments. They work the whole day, carpenters and plumbers. During the workplace, they are talking to other believers, other people, bringing them to Christ. Every evening, they have prayer for three hours. right? And every Sundays, they have four or five services. Who's the pastor? Carpenter. right? Or a plumber. They hardly know anything about the Bible. Right? Of course, now uh, what people are doing is because of the revival, people are traveling there, providing them resources, providing them teachings. But they are saying, no, we don't want anything. All we need is God. Right? All we need is we don't want your finances. We don't want your money. We don't want anything. How, it, how it's going on? Let it go on. So there's this article and uh, this plumber. Plumber, you know, the plumbers, the guys who fix water taps and all of it. He, uh, uh, in one of the rural parts of uh, Punjab, started, you know, just like a small church. And right now, there are 400 to 500 people coming to, his, to the church. Now, the best part is they have open fields. So they pay the owner, or if they are the owner, then it's good. But they pay the owner and say, you want to use the field. There is no mic system. There is no LED screen. There is no stage. One person standing and preaching. You know, they were, they were saying that, you know, uh, God supernaturally gave strength to these people where when they spoke, 300, 400 people could hear. Right? And eventually, of course, they got speakers and all. But initially, they could hear. Is there something which the Holy Spirit cannot do? You know, sometimes we, we think, oh, we need all of this. God is above that. What did Jesus do? When he stood on that mountain, he spoke to 5,000 people. No mixer, no analog, 
digital mixer, no in-ears, nothing. He spoke. They all heard. 5,000 people. Can he do it now? He can do it now. Right? And you should read about it. Go to Google and read about this. Right? It is true. It, it, what God is doing in India. Only thing is, I think yesterday somebody sent me a video where this news channel, uh, they c come to a Christian program in North India, right? They come to this Christian program and say, now why have you, you, you become Christians? You're making uh, India as a nation. You're making it a, uh, you're not make, letting it become a, you know, uh, the nation that it has to be a Hindu nation. You're, you're, you know, you're all uh, becoming Christians. And these guys are fearless in the interview. Maybe I'll share the video uh, that was sent to me. Fearless. Right? They're saying, this is, I think, last week. They're saying, why should we become, we will do what we want to do. And the reporter is saying, then we'll take you to jail. Take me to jail. And these guys are, you know, they're so strong. And they're saying, no, you are getting money from uh, other countries. Why, you all don't get money from other countries? You all don't get? And, you know, they're so strong. They're so convicted. And this other person is saying, um, uh, all we believe in all gods. So this uh, this guy is saying, I, we believe we don't believe in all gods, but among all gods, this is Jesus is the greatest god. And it almost you know became like a violent attack on the Christian. But they were fearless in front of the cameras. And this is you know uh, national news. It's going everywhere. I was so happy when I saw that. I said, God, thank you. For this authority and this, you know, sometimes we only look at the bad or the sad things that are happening. Churches being beaten up, pastors put into prison, but there is a move of God happening. There's this whole boldness, and it's happening in our nation. You know, with the anti-conversion bill, they are fearless, right? And they are on the news. They're saying it's okay, right? Uh, I'll probably share the video. You can see it. But how is all this happening? Is it their own intellect, their own understanding? God's wisdom, the wisdom of the cross, making the world foolish, greater than the wisdom of the world. Right? Last point here a portion with the great, Isaiah 53 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Look at this. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great Christ triumphed at the cross and entered into a place of honor, the right hand of the Father, exalted above all power. So, therefore, I will divide the portion with the great. Right? So, when the Lord Jesus, he triumphed on the cross, he finished what he had to do. God, he went. The Bible says he was seated at the right hand of the Father. The Bible, the right hand, means the hand of authority. Right? Uh, I, uh, Jeremiah says, stretch out your hand, O God. Stretch out your right hand upon uh, this nation. Right? A hand of authority. Right? A right is always a place of authority. Uh, we uh, we use it right even now. Hey, he's my right hand. Meaning, after me, he has all the authority, or she has all the authority, right? So Christ, when he triumphed on the cross, he became the right hand of the Father. He went and he was seated there. Christ shares his triumph with us, and we become his powerful one. Now I always give this example, right? It's not like Jesus won and he's saying, okay, I won. I defeated the cross. I defeated the devil. So it's not like it was a competition between the devil and Jesus. No. On the cross, the Lord Jesus was looking at each one of us. Right? He was not looking at the devil. Right? In his mind on the cross, it was not like Jesus was thinking, oh, devil, I'm going to defeat you. Now let's see who's going to be the winner, you or me. I've uh, I've overcome temptations. I've I've never I've never sinned. Now this cross is here. Once I finish the cross, I have destroyed you. No, that was not in his mind. In his mind, on the cross was you and me. 
when I die on the cross, my people, my children can call God our Father. It was you and I on the cross. It was not a competition with the devil, right? It was for you and me, right? But when he won, he said, now I'm giving you the authority. You and I, Ephesians 1, are seated with him in heavenly places. We have the authority. Right? We are victorious. We are righteous. We are justified, sanctified, holy, because he has given us the strength. Right? And he shares his spoil with us. It is for anyone, anybody can come to the cross. Finally, the uniqueness of Christ. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. While on the cross, what did Jesus do? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He stood as an intercession for his own accusers. Now, he's doing the same thing. He's standing next to the Father and he's making intercession. What is he doing? He's saying, God, Father, this, this boy or this girl, this is his weakness. But give him the strength. Give him an opportunity. He will believe in me. He will you know, do the work of the ministry. Or maybe he's called to do this. Right now he's turning away. Don't put your judgment upon him. Remember the cross. Remember the blood that was shed. What is the father doing? Right? It's like this. Okay, This is a person. And God is looking at the judgment. When, when the father looks at, judge, at, at sin, what must he do? What does the father do when he looks at sin? He has to bring his righteous judgment. Right? When there's sin, the father brings judgment. But all of a sudden, Jesus comes and stands. In between him and the Father, Jesus is standing. Now, Jesus is saying, okay, he's weak. He's tired. He, he's, he's not able to overcome temptations. It's okay. Give him some time. Don't pass your judgment on him. Right? I'm just painting a picture for you. And the Lord Jesus is probably there with the blood because the Hebrew says he's making intercession with his own blood, not the blood of rams and goats. So he's standing there with the blood and he's saying, don't bring judgment on Paul. Remember this blood? Remember the cross? And now the Father's looking at me through the eyes of Jesus and saying, okay, even though you, are, you have sin, even though you are uh, you know, living in uh, sin, when you ask forgiveness, I will look at you as righteous. I will look at you as just as if you have not sinned. Because the sun is here. If there's no sun, gone. He will pour out his judgment on us. You see what the cross did for us. He is able to save to the uttermost. No matter how far we go away, if we come back to the cross, we can find forgiveness. Uh, this should be an encouragement for us, right? Especially when we are ministering to people. Uh, and when we are ministering, we, we feel that this person or that person, I don't think they'll accept Christ. Or the prime minister or the president, how will they accept Christ? They have other things to do. He's able to save to the uttermost. Amen? Amen. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll, do, we'll get into the next chapter.